The Southern Christian Leadership Conference is a not-for-profit advocacy organization that's committed to nonviolent action to achieve social, economic, and political justice. The SCLC consists of localized chapters, as well as affiliates located throughout the country, and supports the organization by working in their respective communities, implementing national programs, such as voter registration, improvement of education, and direct action against it or inequitable treatment. They stand as an advocate for those who are on the margins of society. And if you wanna know more about the SCLC, they do some great work in really providing a platform for racial justice as well as social justice and international human rights organization. Joining us to provide their point of view on the matter, I'm joined by a very special guest. We're pleased to be joined by the General Counsel at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC, Council Charles Brooks. And uh, Council Brooks, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you taking out the time. Well, we appreciate having the discussion. And when we talk about having the discussion, I think there's no more than uh, a more seminal moment than what we're going through right now to really have the LC SCLC on our platform. Uh, I wonder if you will, just give us from your perspective, give us a little bit about your emotions and your thoughts as we're seeing continued topics of racial injustice, police brutality, things that the SCLC fought for years ago that still remain prevalent today. Exactly. The, the, the troubling side is that the cyclical nature of what we're dealing with continues to happen again and again in terms of how we're dealing with basically lynching in 2020, which many people thought that they left behind and never really did. It just took on new forms and new aberrations in terms of its previous uh, state. So in terms of what I find to be hopeful about it, because I don't want this to be a depressing story, is there are some drill downs on policy. So just kind of giving you a quick historical reference on it. You know, 1866, the United States government said, hey, we got to do something with all these free slaves. They wanted to pass all these laws. The president's like, eh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to provide this kind of protection. It led to concrete change, which was the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which we've used to this day. So if you fast forward today, there are some very good discussions from a legal uh, standpoint to address qualified immunity. Uh, in the state of New York, the 48 hour rule, what it meant in the past and in terms of how it affected people. In terms of, you can't talk to a police officer or any witnessing police officer after a shooting for 48 hours to allow them to talk to police or uh, to talk to their lawyer or whoever they want to speak to. So some of the policy addressing as opposed to just saying, this is horrible, we need to change that makes me very hopeful. And we are seeing change. I mean, right here in New York, we've got the 50A legislation. Uh, the governor signed that into law, put forth by uh, legislators here. We are, seeing, we are seeing a lot of progress. I know it's often said, you know, the SCLC was also involved in a lot of the protesting, but also the policy and the advocacy. Speak to us for a minute. I talked to people about protest. I said, protest is really about advocacy. But then when you talk about the other part, the strategy, and also coming forward with policy, policy and advocacy also go hand in hand. Exactly. Because the advocacy of passion without a plan doesn't really get you far. You have to have passion for how you want to change, passion about how you want to make a change to the community, but then let's lay out a plan to get there. Because you're just exhausted if you just come out and you're just angry and you don't focus it as opposed to taking it anger and making that energy and making that energy focus toward a result. And once you focus on having that result of ultimately accomplished, that's what the SELC is about. So going to some of the specific answers, both historically and the past, uh, just to kind of flash into history, because there's, obviously there's a ton of dealing with SELC. Uh, one of the most recent, which is kind of easy to quantify is you had a county in Georgia in the 80s that didn't have any black residents. Well, now it has a lot. Well, the reason was there was a march read by uh, Reverend Lowry when he was the president of the organization in the 80s. That led to people talking about, okay, well, now change the policies about who can live in this county. Well, now Forsyth, Georgia has a significant black population. So it was a wrong, it was a protest, it was a plan, and it yielded a result. Talk to me about Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, Kenosha right now. As we're talking about Kenosha and looking out there in Kenosha, we're finding right now that a lot of people are still up in arms 
over the inequality that seems to be happening when it comes to a shooter. Here you have a young man who wanted to be a part of the deputized militia. The sheriff says, I'm not deputizing militia. He kills, he kills peaceful protesters at a Black Lives Matter uh, rally. Yet and still, as you're going for, or as a part of the Black Lives Matter movement, I should say, uh, and then yet and still, when we see him walking, we're walking down with an armed rifle, and he's walking in front of police officers, and the police officers give him a pass. But yet and still, we know that if that's an African-American man who's walking armed, that's going to be a totally different story. The inequities between whites and blacks, particularly in the area of justice uh, that leads to injustice. Give me your take on what and, and, and what, your, what your response to that is. One of the age old weapons of racism that I think gets overlooked on occasion is forming the narrative. In other words, what are the facts that suit my end result? And those are the facts that I'm going to talk about. So one of the facts that we go back to is people talk about the part of the video where two people are shot and they were like, well, the kid was running away. He shot to protect himself. That's a complete change of the actual fact. The reason why the two people that you see on a video are rush, or multiple people are rushing for him, he's already shot someone. A young man is sputtering on the ground dying. He dies. And he runs and the next set of people who are shot are actually rushing in because of the first shot. And I don't believe the first action was caught on video, or I've yet to see video of that covers. So in terms of the inequity of it, is you see that as an inequity unto itself. But then let's go back to another previous inequity. Uh, I believe your New York Post showed a picture of a young man cleaning building. Oh, he was some kind of civic leader before the shootings took place. That was forming a narrative as to why you should be sympathetic to the shooter. And part of that is about some of the interviews he gave, I think, to the UK Daily Mail. But the young man talked about our job. We are here. So he was acting as a function of some organizational structure, no matter how loosely you want to fit it, vigilantism, militia, whatever. Uh, we know that there was a Facebook, Facebook group that was formed shortly before the shooting, inviting assistance from our members. We know that there was an interaction with the police officers after the curfew. When the police are there to get people off the street, encounter a large number of white people with guns and basically give them the okay and call some water. Giving them the authority to understand you have the ability to act in this space. I'm giving you that authority through action alone. Because that's what we gotta understand. Everything's not policy. Some things are what you do. So right. I say, I don't like you, but I put a thousand dollars in your pocket. I think you think I like you regardless. So we've got to move between what someone says and what somebody does in terms of finding out what was the true intent. And we can't allow nerves to form around facts that allow people to say this happened when we know it didn't. And we're seeing that all over. And to your point, that's not only Kenosha, that's Breonna Taylor. Uh, that's, uh, you know, the names go on and on and on. And I think if you go back all the way back to Trayvon, now you begin to understand he wasn't allowed to tell his narrative. He only received one, and that's what the press carried, for the most part. Charles Brooks is the general counsel for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And, uh, yeah, we have him here as our guest here on the Social Justice Forum, and it's an honor and a privilege to uh, have him being able to share in on the discussion. Uh, and when we talk about social justice, we know that the SCLC is one of the background organizations, the foundational organizations for the social justice movement. For somebody who may be a viewer, and you know, part of our job as a journalist is you assume that your audience knows nothing. Please take the time to equate people with a little bit of the history of the SCLC, as we know uh, one of its original are the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Correct, you had a group of individuals coming together who are looking for direct action, so that people can understand the difference. There are a lot of wonderful civil rights organizations of which African Americans were either formed part of the backbone of it or was certainly after its formation. And then W.E.B. Du Bois was one of the founders of the NAACP. So you had these multiple organizations working toward multiple issues because African Americans don't face one issue. We faced a host of issues related to the economic justice, which you alluded to before, dealing with poverty, and also things dealing with police interaction, opportunity, redlining housing. 
So historically, you had a group that said, look, we need direct action. The other organizations I'm working on that are working in their way to try to address it. We need to have something that formally approaches what's going on and what's happening in that particular issue. And so you had other organizations that I think one of the forerunners, uh, the Montgomery Improvement Association, when Dr. Martin Luther King goes to Montgomery and works with a young lady by the name of Rosa Parks about dealing with how African-Americans were being mistreated from the city, you had that formation of saying, hey, African-Americans are gonna be the ones on the front lines to help. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't people of other races who were brought on board. There were other people who have died and perished and it has some eerie allusions to this person, this time period right now. You have the old Luzo who was killed in Alabama uh, with the federal government a part of uh, having at least somebody who's working with the federal government in the car that shot him. So uh, not the collusive issue in terms of African Americans, it's just that SELC has been one that says, we can take a leadership position to direct action to get the change to the policies and the laws that we want so that things can be more equitably assumed. Because part of it is, it wasn't just about, at the time, I think a lot of it was, it appears to be about segregation and we want integration. Yeah, that's, that's part of it and that's a very strong part of what it's about. But once again, that's about a narrative being formed by what our intents were. At that time, the first time a white male was convicted for raping a black woman was in 1959 in the Barbara Owens case. SCLC was there. So there was a lot of global scope in terms of inequities, lynchings, uh, extrajudicial killings that SCLC has been a part since 1957 uh, when it was formed. So those are kind of issues that Dr. King and all of all his progeny in terms of the leadership until our present president, uh, Dr. Charles Steele, who uh, was in Wisconsin, I believe this weekend. And so trying to address some of the issues in terms of what happened to the Blake family. Yeah. Give me a little bit more about what's happening right now, because we talk about the SCLC boots on the ground, a lot of issues to deal with. We talk about not just police brutality, which, of course, is at the forefront right now. Uh, but give a little bit uh, to our viewers about what you're particularly working on in this time and season, given the climate. In, in terms of this issue, let me answer that, let me answer that question in two parts. Okay. You know, there's multiple areas that are being addressed. One of the most successful uh, policies right now, and, and I would say right up until this year, I would have probably looked at our Roanoke Rapids program to get African Americans a part of the uh, power line job. Uh, that has been an incredibly successful position because we established what are the items with less than a year's worth of education, no college, can you make $100,000? And so we identified various jobs which fit that bill. And then there was some young men in the area that was very economically impoverished. And we began to get young individuals into it. And for the most part, it was male just because of the lifting requirements on the power line job. And so you went from the people, I think every last one of the guys who we had, had graduated from high school were unemployed. All the ones who have completed the program, I think, make at least $60,000 a year, one of which in his early 20s, make it over 100000 from a time period he was making nothing at all. So I would have been excited about that program. I would have been excited about our work of uh, trying to get minimum wage. But let me go to really what the heart of your question is about, is addressing police brutality right now. You've had activism on that issue going back a year, especially in my Miami SDLC chapter, dealing with inequities within the criminal justice system. And they're so mirrored and they're so splintered. Let me just give you one example. <clears throat> one of the things that's going on now is the question is, the shooter Rittenhouse, how did he get there? Who helped him get there? And who was responsible and what happened in the interaction right before the first white male was shot, right? That issue is called felony murder. Most black people have heard about it. Somebody sitting in the car. I had nothing to do with the robbery. I just wanted to get a ride with Joe Schmo. I weren't responsible. And the cop said, eh, you in the car. You were the lookout guy. You were the something. Felony murder, go away. That's pretty common in New York. That's pretty common across the United States. Well, why are we applying that standard there, but there doesn't seem to be a real rush to find out whether or not any other members of the militia slash vigilante slash whatever label you want to apply, who else was responsible with him in conjunction with him in that moment? Who job, because he, he, he uses the phrase our job during the interview with the uh, Daily Mail, I believe, or, or the right. Daily Mail is running the interview. 
what who is, you represent. Yeah, who do you represent? And if you represent a group, like let's say it's a gang. If I say I'm representing Crips and there's a bunch of Crips behind me, if I represent Latin Kings, a bunch of Latin Kings behind me, a bunch of Latin Kings get charged. So why is it that we don't have that scrutiny in this particular circumstance? Curious, you know. So not only are there questions about how this interaction works and what it's about, the question are questions for the DA and the question for the chief of police. Because this is the chief of police who a year, I mean, not a chief of police, sorry, sheriff's office, who talked a year in advance about shooting shoplifters. So your law and order other than the Delantes, which you work with, See, no one should be above getting a pass, and that's about what the narrative is about. So now the focus is on Rittenhouse should be free. And of course, I believe there should be justice served for what Rittenhouse did. However, that should not be our only focus in this particular circumstance. Who were the other individuals? What did the police know? No. And how did the police act to give him authority if they did? And those mm. are not questions that I've drawn at this point in time, but I don't see those questions being asked, and that's very distressing. Uh, we're dwindling down on our segment, but I do want to get to this point about the upcoming election. The SCLC is very uh, boots uh, uh, to the ground on this issue, too. Voting rights. When we see the voter suppression that's happening, mailboxes being taken away, the postal system, having, it seems as though the voter suppression continues to rage, and that's something that the SCLC began its foundation on. Talk to us about the voting rights issue and where you guys are in terms of uh, making your voice heard and what you want the public to know. Yeah, first of all, yeah, I want to, before, before we close down, number one, in order to make your voice heard through the SCLC is addressing your issue, it's $25, even though the National is making that large number. And if there's membership in your area or another area of interest, you can join through that area. So we have a wonderful chapter in New Orleans, for instance. If you maybe you had friends, or maybe somebody in the New York area went to school and some of the several HBCUs use theirs, Dillard or Xavier or Southern University of Louisiana, uh, Southern University of New Orleans, and you want to join, you can join with that, and as a adult, it's $25. Because part of it is economic freedom of prize to these organizations as well. Whether it's SCLC, NAACP, Urban League, NAN, whatever you, whatever has your interest. But if you're not joining those organizations and you're not giving your money, you're saying that you think that the government can address these kind of problems for you. So don't give authority to the government under that association and then complain about the results. But going back to your issue in terms of voter suppression and issues with that, uh, we worked quite a bit because one of the first things that we've said for a while was when the ruling from the Supreme Court came down from the Shelby case, uh, Shelby County, Alabama, that it was essentially trying to reinstall segregation. And when we said that as an organization, we were basically people went, oh, that's a joke, that's funny, voter suppression. Well, now everybody understands how real it is, how systemic it is, how that people are being oppressed in terms of their ability to get to the polls. So I would say two things can happen right now. A, I'd like to see you join the organization. B, it is very simple now in this world to send emails to your congressperson, to your senator. Even if you're in a very conservative area, you don't feel like your voice is being heard. You'd be surprised. When people are inundated with phone calls in their offices that you see, they want to know why. So in terms of voter suppression, you can say, hey, I want more handled in terms of questioning the Postmaster General. Because his answers have been, to say that they're grossly uh, inaccurate to what's going on with the Postal Service is just, uh, it's just bizarre. Because the Postal Service, financially has been historically very strong. And now this new argument, which is floating around for a little bit about all oh, the post service of health, but it's about voter suppression. And that voter right. suppression creeps in, it's an evil animal and it's a way to keep you from moving forward. And just, and, and I'm gonna get into it real quick and I'm gonna go, William F. Buckley and James Baldwin were arguing about the Negro vote over six, almost 60 years, it's over 60 years ago. We can't go back. This is not even about going forward. This is about holding ground. That's where we are right now. These issues are about holding ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got a lot to talk about. Got to bring you back and we share a little bit more uh, about what is going on. But thank you for taking the time to share a little bit. Before we get out of here, once again, for people who want to be part of the SCLC, there is this misnomer that you got to live in the South to be a part of the SCLC. I know the answer, but please give the people the answer and then tell them how they can be a part again. Yes. 
you a if you if you want to be a part of the SCLC, it doesn't matter where you live. As a matter of fact, we have members overseas. Maybe you're watching this, and hopefully your broadcast audience reaches our soldiers in Germany, South Korea, Italy. Um, you can join. Go to the website National SCLC and join, and all click in twenty five dollars, and you're a member, and your voice gets heard. Because part of it is, if you're the voice that's funding it, then it's an African American voice in the room, and where the funding comes from can inflect how it reflects what the voice says and what it says about it. So you really have to think about that. And we're talking about $25 for a year. I think people can do it. That's that's not even remotely what most people pay in their cable or even their rope from charges for the year. Or yeah. 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 <laughs> Charles Brooks, General Counsel for the SCLC. Thank you so much for being with us here on the Social Justice Forum. A lot of enlightening information. And definitely you got to come back. Thank you so much. I look forward to it, man. I appreciate it. All righty, listen, we encourage you, stay with us. We've got more social justice forums. If you want to find out more about the SCLC, please go to their website, find out the information, as he said, $25 just to join. We've got more show. Stay with us. We're coming right back right after this.